Good morning. Today is Tuesday, April the 6th, and I hope and pray you had a good night's rest last night. I certainly did. I was tired from the weekend, um, but yesterday was a good day. We had the day off. The offices were closed. I, I did work part of the day yesterday, but then took the rest of the day and had a good long nap yesterday afternoon. That felt good. Um, glad to see everybody with us today. I I hope and pray that you're all doing well. Um, one prayer request that, that I was made aware of last night, Kim Crawford, you know her, she and John, who are members here at First Conyers. Kim had texted Vanessa last night to let her know that her granddaughter, Michaela, who's five years old, uh, has been diagnosed with COVID. And so let's pray for little Michaela and pray for Kim and John as a, um, it's a heart heart-wrenching thing when your little little one is sick. And so let's pray for little Michaela, if you remember her in prayer. And um, the last I knew of Constantine as his coming home from his last round of treatment, he's doing well with no, no uh, apparent side effects from the chemo. So let's continue to pray for them. And um, you may have a prayer need. If you want to share that, you can go ahead and share that on the feed, and let's pray for one another. Uh, but we've we've turned the first quarter of the year is past us now. So this Sunday, remind you that our small groups are opening back up again. I think the first hour of small groups is 8.30, that may be 8.15. Check with your small group leader. I can't remember. Then our uh, one 10 o'clock service, and then our family small groups uh, are at 11, young adults, children, um, our uh, youth, all of those. And so looking forward to that, excited about being able to come back. And if those, if you're watching and you had your first round of COVID vaccine a couple of weeks ago here at First Conyers, we've now scheduled the date uh, for the second round that can be given. And I'm not sure if there's enough available for those to get first rounds. You'll need to call Reagan Pharmacy to get that information. We don't have any information. We're just simply hosting the site. But for those who are looking to get their second round of the Pfizer COVID vaccine, that'll be here Sunday, April the 18th, following our small group hour. I think it'll begin at 12 o'clock in the gymnasium. So uh, those are the things. We're going to conclude First Peter this morning, and then we'll go into the book of Galatians tomorrow. I had a had a note from a message, text message from one of the individuals that watches this every day. They don't watch it on Facebook Live. They watch it on YouTube later in the day. And they were sharing with me, they, they've been believer over 45 years, uh, but they can't recall any time that they've ever really just systematically gone through a book of the Bible and just read through and had devotional thoughts on it. And so that's one of the reasons we do this. It's one of the reasons I do this, just to help encourage people to get in the Word daily, um, to know God through His Word, and to walk in that. So today we'll finish First Peter. Tomorrow we'll start in Galatians. I would encourage you to share these uh, posts, not for popularity, but so that we can spread the Word, that people would get in the Word. A couple of songs this morning I'm going to start out with that kind of take us back to the 70s that were written directly in relation to these verses that we're going to look at in First Peter. Oh, oh, oh. 
my burdens and down at your feet. Anytime I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares on you. Very simple, I cast all my cares. Sandy and I were talking last night uh, about a current situation that uh, that I'm having to address and deal with, and I said to her, I said, you know, we almost always know the right thing to do. Um, it's implementing the right thing is what's difficult, is what we're challenged with, because we have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to guide us. And there are those situations that we come across in life. There may not be a specific verse or chapter that we can go to in Scripture to give us the answer, but there are principles in the Scriptures that guide us. And we have the Holy Spirit that speaks to our heart through the Word, and we know the right thing to do. What we struggle with oftentimes is how to implement the right thing. And so I'm always reminded that when I, when I don't have clarity of how to implement the right thing to do, that, that may be an indication of the Lord's telling me just to wait. Uh, wait on Him. He's leading. I'll know what to do when the time comes. And He will guide us and direct us. So just log that nugget in your brain, in your mind. Sometimes we get in trouble when we impulsively do the right thing at the wrong time. And so we need to wait on the Lord. Peter's closing out his letter. And if you remember in the early part of chapter 5, he's speaking to those who are elders, those who are pastors and exhorting them how to lead as a shepherd, uh, not, as a, not as an overlord, not for greedy gain. Um, and then he, he tells us all that, that we're to clothe ourselves in humidity, t humility towards one another. And then he tells us in verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. We, we talked about that word humility. It carries an attitude of penance. It carries a, a mindset of recognizing who we are in light of God and having a right perspective of ourselves and not to try to get above God, not to be tempted and led in temptation to be haughty and a know-it-all, but humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God uh, you could say that in, in suffering, as in context, he's, he's saying, wait on the Lord. Humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God, and at the proper time, he may exalt you or he may lift you up. There we see God's timing, waiting on God's timing. God is never late. God's never early. God's always on time. 
the challenge for you and I is to, is to wait uh, humbly rather than trying to take matters into our own hands and act immediately, but to humble ourselves. You know, and I find this a lot of times in, in shepherding and pastoring. When I, when I counsel with people, or I know people that have situations and difficulties. Um, sometimes I want to jump in and fix it for them. God has not called me to be the Holy Spirit. God has not called you to be the Holy Spirit. But in a right heart, I may want to jump in and fix it. Sometimes I can circumvent what God is working in that person's life. And, and God has a timing in it. My role is to lead people to the Word. Your role is to lead people to the Word of God and let them make the actions and choices and decisions they need to make based on the Word of God. Allow God time and room to work in people's lives. Then he says in verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. It, it might be easier to apply that if we say, know that he cares for you, therefore you can cast all your cares on him. God cares for us more than, more than we can ever imagine. God wants us to live a life that magnifies him, that glorifies him, that goes well for us in being obedient and walking in relationship. That word cast means to literally hurl. It, the analogy there would be like a garbage man throwing a bag of trash into the trash bin. Hurl, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And then he exhorts them in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their persecution, to remain sober-minded, to be of clear mind, to be of clear perspective, to wait. So often we jump to conclusions. Uh, sober mind means that, that, we, that we take a step back and analyze, we take a step back and look at the situation, we take a step back and hear all of the sides, if you will, be sober-minded, um, and be watchful. That word is used there as a centurion on the, on the wall of the city. To be watchful for, he says, your adversary. And we know who the adversary is. The adversary is the devil and all of his minions. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We don't want to give him opportunity in our lives. So we want to be sober-minded. We want to be watchful. I've learned the enemy has very few tactics, but he, but he repeats the same tactics over and over and over. The Bible says be, be aware of the wiles or the, the devices of the enemy. And in all of our lives, our lives we, we all have a propensity, an area that we have a tendency to kind of fall to. Whether it's a substance, whether it's a gossip, whether it's food, whatever it is, the enemy knows where our weakness is, and he's going to attack in that area, especially in times of stress, especially in times of distress, especially in times of suffering, especially in times when we're tired and we're weak and we're vulnerable. That's when he says, be sober-minded, be watchful, because your enemy prowls around. Sometimes I talk to people, and they're like, man, the enemy's attacking, as if we're surprised. It's, it's no surprise. The enemy's always going to be attacking. And one of the primary ways the enemy attacks the believer is to draw them out of fellowship with the Lord and fellowship with one another. Be careful. Be watchful. Know that that's one of the devices of the enemy. James says that we're to submit ourselves, therefore, to God, Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Notice the sequence in that verse where James says, first we have to submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And so here he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for a vulnerable meal to try to grab. Don't give way to him in that. Know that his number one tactic in your life and in my life as believers, he knows we're saved. He's not going to unsave us. That's done. Once we're saved, we are saved. Once we're truly saved, we're truly saved. But he will do everything he can to try to separate us from fellowship with God and, and fellowship with the body. I think the primary ways he, way he operates in the church 
is that he, he separates us in relationship. We get offended by this. We get offended by that. We don't like this. We don't like that. Listen, the separation that's first taken place between your or my fellowship with God, and then he separates us from one another. Don't allow him to do it. And if you find a fellow believer that's fallen into that trap, lovingly correct them and say, I, I'm not going to follow along in that because I know the enemy wants to trap me up in that too. Can somebody say amen to that? So Sonny, when somebody comes up to complain to you, say, nope, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let myself be an instrument of the enemy unwittingly to cause division, to cause separation, break up in fellowship between him and God. Okay, so he says resist him. And, uh, and then he reminds them that, listen, you're not the only one that's suffering these kinds of things. There are brothers, the brotherhood all around the world is suffering in persecution. He says that in the last part of nine. It is true, misery loves company. And sometimes it's a comfort to know that we're not the only one. Can I tell you, you're not the only one. You're not the only one going through trials. You're not the only one suffering. You're not the only one having hardships. We all do. There's an old Indian proverb that says, my hangnail hurts me a whole lot more than your broken elbow hurts you. <laughs> what he means by that is that is that we all have trials. And 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 it should should be that we follow what Paul says in Romans, that we rejoice with those who rejoice and we suffer along with those who suffer. And so we care for one another. Then verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, circle that, the God of all grace. He is a gracious God, giving unmerited, unearned favor to us, who has called you to his eternal glory. Circle that word called. We are in relationship to him because God first called us. He was the initiator of the relationship. We love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. That'll humble you, right? knowing that there was nothing in me, there was nothing in you that caused God to say, oh, that would be a good one for my kingdom. He or she has a lot of talents. He or she has a lot of gifts. No, no, no. He saw us and said, that one is a wretched sinner separated from me, and I'm going to call them and display my love and my grace in their lives, and I'm going to draw them so that their eyes and their heart will be open to the gift and provision that I have made for them through the blood of Jesus. That's why. So we're called by God, and he's called us to his eternal glory in Christ. He himself will restore. He will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God will restore. The time's going to turn. My dad used to always say, it, everything's going to be all right, son. Everything's going to be all right. Meaning, you may be dealing with something for right now, but everything's going to be all right. And, and Dad had it in his heart, the faith to know that, that in due time, God himself will bring restoration. God in time will strengthen. God in time will confirm, that is confirm our calling, and that God will establish you. And then Peter closes out this letter in verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, I regard him. I have briefly written to you. Savinus was a secretary. He wrote the letters that Paul, as he was uh, Peter, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. He wrote those, and thank God we have them today. Exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. What's contained in this letter is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Um, this, in this letter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is the true grace of God. There are all kinds of voices coming. There are all kinds of voices around us that want to discredit this word of God. But they fall short when closely examined. This is the word of God. It, it's, it doesn't just contain truth. It is the truth. It's absolute truth. So he says, stand firm in it. Verse 13, she who is in Babylon, we're not sure who that was, could be referring to a local church body, could be referring to an individual. We don't know. But they were in the area of Babylon who is likewise chosen, they send you greetings. Evidently, Peter was probably there when he was writing that letter, this letter. And does John Mark, or Mark, my son, greet one another with a, with a kiss of love. 
Peace to all of you who are in Christ Jesus. This Mark is the John Mark who was with Paul and Barnabas. And Paul said, you can't come along with me on the second trip because the first trip you bailed on me. But he's also the one that was uh, that Peter had led to the Lord and he called him his son. He's the one who wrote the gospel of Mark, probably most likely of all of the accounts that Peter had related to him. Mark, John Mark, was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. Therefore, affirming that this church, the body of Christ, is not only for Jew, but it's also for Gentile. And would that God would, um, would give us an opportunity today to share the gospel with somebody. I want to close with an old, old hymn. So I've taken us to the 70s, and now I'm going to take us back somewhere to the 19th century, I think, or early 20th century. Uh, His eye is on the sparrow. Why should I feel
love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. Remember, his eye is on the sparrow. You know he watches over you. Have a great day.